Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We are just going to give everyone a minute or two to log on and we'll begin shortly. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Good morning. Okay, perfect. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are so pleased to present the Wild Cornell Medicine and New York Presbyterian Kidney and Pancreas Transplant Program. And our topic today is Conversations with Cornell Kidney. And this is a six part virtual education series for patients, caregivers, and our transplant community. For conversation one, we will discuss dialysis or transplant. What is best for you? Our speakers today are Judith A. Hamilton, RN, SRN, CCTC. She is the Chief Transplant Coordinator. Judith graduated with her SRN in England in 1980. She began her nursing career in the Trauma, Neuro, and Open Heart ICU in Northwestern Chicago. She joined the NYP Cornell ER in 1988. Judith entered the kidney and pancreas field in 1997 at the Rogosin Institute, where she was the director of living donor and special projects from 2005 to 2009. She has been a chief transplant coordinator from 2009 to present, managing both waiting lists and living donor programs. And our other speaker today is Eliza Bensley, RN, BSN, and she's a clinical transplant educator. Eliza started her nursing career in organ donation after graduating from Rutgers Accelerated Nursing Program in 2014 and joining the New Jersey Sharing Network as a multi-organ transplant coordinator. Seeking clinical care experience, she left NJSN to work in Jersey City's trauma ICU. Missing transplant greatly, she joined the Wild Cornell Kidney Transplant Team six years ago, working with waitlist candidates. Eliza is a passionate healthcare communicator with a focus in patient education, health advocacy, digital transplant outreach, and strategic growth. We encourage you during this session to please submit any and all of your questions in the Q&A section, and we will do our best to get to all of them. It is my pleasure to now turn it over to Judith and Eliza. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elisa. We Thanks, really appreciate Elisa you being here today. Um, everyone, thank you for joining us. We're very excited about this series and to kick it off, we are covering the basics as Lisa mentioned. So I'm going to begin by talking about kidney disease. Now, many of you attending already understand this, but just to review, chronic kidney disease is a condition that results in the loss of kidney function over time, losing the ability to keep you healthy. A healthy kidney is responsible for cleaning the blood, producing urine, regulating blood pressure, balancing fluids and chemicals in the body, and signaling the bones to make red blood cells. Kidney disease can cause high blood pressure, anemia, weak bones, poor nutritional health, and nerve damage. Kidney disease also increases your risk of heart and blood vessel disease. Now, kidney disease affects an estimated 37 million people. As you can see in this chart, that's more than one in seven. 15% of US adults are estimated to have chronic kidney disease. And it is more common among people ages 65 and older, and nearly 786,000 people in the United States are living with end-stage renal disease, with 71% of people on dialysis and 29% with a kidney transplant. Next, I'd like to talk about the disparities in kidney disease. Now, kidney disease dispor disproportionately affects communities of color. Black or African Americans are almost four times more likely than, his and Hispanics or Latinos are 1.3 times more likely to have kidney failure compared to white Americans. Although they make up only 13.5% of the population, Black or African Americans make up more than 35% of dialysis patients. Kidney disease is also more common in women than in men. About one in two people with very low kidney function, not on dialysis, don't even know they have kidney disease. Now, as you can see from this chart, we can tell that 65 
and older patients are the ones that are most likely being impacted, but I think this demonstrates the disparities and um, we're going to talk more about the causes of kidney disease. Now, many of you already may know this, but two of the most common causes of CKD are diabetes and high blood pressure. These account for two thirds of all cases. Diabetes affects blood sugar levels and over time damages many organs in the body, including the kidneys. High blood pressure increases the force of blood against the wall of blood vessels, leading to more damage. As you can see in this chart, 39% of end-stage renal disease is responsible from diabetes and high blood pressure is 26%. Um, glomerular nephritis, which is a disease that damages the kidneys filtering units, is the third most common type of kidney disease. Other causes of it, kidney disease are inherited diseases such as polycystic kidney disease, lupus, and other autoimmune diseases. Obstructive diseases such as kidney stones can also cause long-term damage. Diagnosis to end stage, which is when you require dialysis or a transplant, can take years or be immediate. And once your kidneys do reach stage five, you require dialysis or a transplant to stay alive. Now, to cover the treatment, again, many of you may already know this, but the best treatment of all kidney disease is facilitated by early detection. However, once kidneys fail, treatment with dialysis or a kidney transplant is needed. Now, dialysis removes waste and extra fluid from your blood. Hemodialysis, blood is pumped through a dialysis machine where it is cleaned and returned to your body. Patients receive hemodialysis usually three to four times a week, either at home or at a dialysis center. And home dialysis is an increasingly popular mode of treatment and it is associated with better outcomes. While peritoneal dialysis, your blood is cleaned inside your body every day through the lining of your abdomen using a special fluid that is periodically changed. It can be done at home or at work or at school or even during travel. It's really up to your nephrologist to discuss this option and um, up to you to bring this up. But just to note, people with CKD may not feel ill or notice any symptoms until the CKD is advanced. And the only way to find out if people have CKD is through simple blood and urine tests. Now, another mention of the treatment types for kidney disease is a kidney transplant. A kidney transplant places a healthy kidney in your body from a deceased donor or from a living donor, such as a close relative, spouse, friend, or generous stranger. We will talk more about the types of transplants available in the next couple of slides. Benefits of a transplant include a higher patient survival rate than remaining on dialysis as visualized on this graph on the right. Additionally, there is a reported improved quality of life for patients because of the freedom from dialysis, reduction in dietary limitations, and the ability to return to work. So this graph does a great example of explaining the ways in which um, deceased donor transplant or living donor transplant can increase your lifespan compared to dialysis. Now we are going to take a little break and talk about some of these options. I'm going to turn the microphone over to Judith and I see we do have a question. So let's start answering that. So our first question today is can a person who is in hospice care at home due to Parkinson's, donate a kidney on my behalf. Well, we're gonna start off with a really difficult question to answer. Um, <clears throat> Parkinson's disease in and of itself does not necessarily mean uh, that the potential don donor uh, has any amount of kidney disease, uh, but that's certainly something that would need to be assessed. Um, we have had similar circumstances to this uh, twice. We have to, um, if you're willing to give your name, th this is a long answer to this question. You know, it's not just a simple uh, sort of one sentence response. If you're willing, I could either give you a call or send you an email following uh, today's uh, webinar uh, and, and we could talk offline if that's okay with you. Judith, um, I can actually message the person who submitted the question. Yeah. Um, and I can connect you both via email. That's perfect. Thank, thank you, Elisa. 
it, it, that would just it's about a 30 minute conversation so uh, we'll take that offline any other questions oh we're giving you all the answers obviously that was the only one that we have at the moment okay so why choose transplant over dialysis uh yeah, let, let's go over some of the reasons. Next slide. So the types of transplants, let's discuss those first. Uh, living donor, uh, what are the advantages of having a living donor? First, it includes no waiting time. So if you have a nice, healthy, willing donor, um, you can pretty much uh, go to transplant immediately and uh, even preempt the need for dialysis. These kidneys usually have a longer life, um, on average less twice as long as a deceased donor kidney, and these kidneys work literally while still in the operating room. It was one of the first things I noticed uh, when I was in the operating room watching my first case, that uh, the surgeon hadn't even had time to hook all the connections up, and the urine is literally draining down his leg. I, I mean, it was just incredible to see. Um, we're not going to get too much into living donation now because we do, uh, we, we are going to use a whole uh, webinar uh, covering living donation uh, next month. Uh, so it it's, will be a lot more comprehensive then. <clears throat> Who's a good living donor? Well, the bottom line, they've got to be willing to donate and they've got to be healthy. Above and beyond that, uh, there are hurdles that we can certainly overcome, things like ABO incompatible, those types of things. Again, we will cover that more uh, a month from now. If the person's got two healthy kidneys, that's absolutely, we only need one kidney to survive. We know that. Uh, family history is not necessarily prohibitive. Uh, you do need to have good overall health. That's including psychiatric health. Um, obesity can be an issue, not because the surgery is difficult to do, uh, just more that if you have a BMI that's 35 or higher, uh, then the incidence of type 2 diabetes certainly increases, and that's not a risk we're willing to take. Uh, you do need to have medical insurance coverage and access to health care. We've had people come here from all areas of the world wanting to donate, but th there is no doctor within 2,000 miles. I mean, they literally live in the middle of nowhere, and that would cause us a lot of concern. Um, federal law states that a donor needs to be 18 years or older. Here at Cornell, uh, we, we have a, a cutoff at 21 years of age, unless it's an extreme circumstance. Um, do not rule any donor out. You may think you know what a donor or who a donor can be, but it's quite surprising. Please let the center do that for you. Next slide. So uh, the second type of transplant is a deceased donor transplant. Um, in this instance, uh, patients are placed on UNOS. And what UNOS stands for is the United Network of Organ Sharing. And this is a federally organized group um, that run transplant. And that's all types of transplant, not just kidney transplant, but heart, lung, liver, et cetera, et cetera. And you stay on this list and, until you match up with uh, a, a donor. Um, allocation is generally based on waiting times. There is other criteria that come into play, but waiting time is the one that carries the most weight. Uh, donors actually are scored. Uh, and what this means is uh, we are able to calculate the length that we expect that kidney to last and a recipient also receives a score and what we are able to do is match the donors that are going to last a long time with the recipients with the longest life expectancy and and uh, when this was there was a sort of change brought in in 2014 um, we estimate that we saved about 7,000 kidney years uh, when, when we brought these uh, rulings in so next uh, slide <clears throat> so who's eligible for kidney transplant? Uh, your kidney function, first of all, has to meet a certain level. Um, the 20 mil per min, uh, that's a what we call glomerular filtration rate. And essentially anyone that one of you that have done a 24 hour urine collection, this is one of the things that we're looking at. That's the most accurate way to figure out this value. 
uh, we can estimate it with what we call a serum creatinine, uh, but, but again, the 24 hour urine is the best to have. Um, you must have a support person. Um, it, this is not an easy thing to go through. And it's, it's very helpful if you have someone that can bring you to um, appointments, they can help you, uh, you know, so that you, you leave the doctor's office and your head's literally spinning with, with information that you've been given. And if you have a second person that's present, they can help you uh, sort of re remember some of the facts that were, were given to you. Uh, what are the exclusions? I think that's probably the easiest way to go when we're talking about eligibility for transplant because the vast majority of people are eligible. But what would rule you out is if you have active malignancy. Um, it doesn't mean that's something that's permanent. If you, for instance, have an invasive uh, breast malignancy, five years free of disease, then you can go on and be listed for transplant. So it's not necessarily... Uh, sort of a, a permanent rule out. Active infection, the infection would need to be fully treated and cleared before we could transplant you. Inoperable cardiac or vascular disease. Uh, it's when we put you through a kidney transplant, um, it's, this is something that's very stressful to the heart. So we want to make sure that your heart is actually healthy enough to go through this. Uh, the whole purpose of a kidney transplant is to prolong your life, not shorten it. And if you have a huge heart attack during that surgery, then we've not done our job. So we, it is possible that we could decline someone because of their cardiac status. Active substance abuse. Um, I think abuse is the key word here rather than use. Everyone can go and have a glass of wine at night. That's fine. But if you have five glasses of wine, then that's gone from actual use over to in the abuse category. Um, this is something that we do get our psychi uh, psychiatrists involved with because where exactly is that line and what do we need to do to sort of move you through to the next step? Uh, we do need to make sure that you've got adequate financial insurance and medication coverage. There's absolutely no point whatsoever in giving someone a kidney and then they're not able to pay for these medications. They're extremely expensive and it, this is uh, one thing that is a current theme through transplant, uh, making sure that you have everything in place that you need. Uh, so, social or psychiatric instability. Um, Usually people with psychiatric illness, uh, the reason they become unstable is because they stop taking their medication. So again, if they're not taking the psychiatric, psychiatric medication, it's unlikely that they're going to take their transplant medication or the immunosuppression. Uh, so that's something that we certainly um, have psychiatry uh, delve into. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the tests that we do? I think each and every one of you that have um, gone through the initial evaluation will tell me, yeah, 17 tubes were drawn. Um, we do require a lot of blood work. Uh, the first testing you see up here is called the HLA tissue typing. Um, and essentially what this is, uh, the little markers on the uh, white blood cells in your body, and it's what makes you you. This is now a molecular test, and uh, it's a, we hopefully are able to identify a donor from someone that has similar tissue to you. If we're able to do so, then that is a kidney that could potentially last uh, longer. Uh, serologies are infections. Uh, you may not have heard of things, but things like uh, cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, a uh, basic metabolic profile is a test that every single time you go to your doctor's office, if you're getting blood drawn, then you're going to get a metabolic profile and a CBC. Uh, the metabolic profile is your basic things like uh, BUN and creatinine, uh, which is your kidney function. And also the CBC is complete blood count. And uh, that's measuring for anemia. And again, most of you will already know that uh, anemia goes sort of hand in hand with kidney disease. 
chest x-ray, looking for pulmonary disease, CT scan, we want to make sure the abdomen is clear of any kind of malignancies, EKG, make sure your heart rhythm is regular, normal, mammogram, pap smear, PSA, these are all routine cancer screenings that you should be doing anyway, uh, but we'll insist that you do um, wh when you come to be on the list. Uh, there can be additional testing and consults depending on each and every individual. This is not, uh, you know, it's tailor made to the individual. We don't just say because you're over this age or you're that gender, uh, you require specific things. We do look at it uh, for each individual and we do try to keep this to a minimal while doing things safely. Uh, cardiac is, is certainly one of the biggest areas that we have concerns and a stress test and an echocardiogram. Usually, uh, you know, anyone with diabetes is going to require these tests. If you've already had them done within the past year, then that's fine. We can get those copies and we can use those. Uh, but if it's been a longer period of time, then we'll probably need to get, repeat, get, to get them repeated. Um, uh, carotid Dopplers, uh, this is uh, just to have a look to the blood flow to your brain, um, non-invasive, easy to do, it's just a Doppler test. Uh, further clearances may be needed uh, from specialists, it, again, it depends on your medical history, and examples of that would be, uh, you know, if you have lupus, for instance, we want to make sure from your rheumatologist that your lupus is what we call quiescent, uh, that it's, it's, it's not active. Um, it could be HIV, we need a clearance from your um, infectious disease doctor, uh, again, just to make sure that you, uh, you know, your disease is, is quiet. Uh, Testing is done to make sure that the patient is healthy enough to undergo surgery, and that's the bottom line. If we feel that there is something that causes some concern uh, that could cause a, a bad outcome, then that's something that we're going to put under a microscope and take a closer look at. Next slide. So once you've done all your testing, um, you are presented in front of a, a multidisciplinary board. This is pretty much everyone that you've met through the process of so social work, finance, surgeon, nephrologist, coordinator. Um, we present you, we review all your tests and uh, determine if we deem you suitable for transplant. Uh, financial approval, yet again, here it comes, uh, uh, raising its head. Uh, again, that's something right before we put you on the list, we want to make sure everything is, is, is uh, you know, in place. Uh, if you have a living donor and they have cleared their medical testing and have been approved to donate, this is probably when we would start to schedule a transplant for you. Um, again, hopingly, uh, hoping uh, that it's a premodality before you start dialysis. But if you don't have the donor, then of course, we do get you on the waiting list and, and start to accrue your time. Um, another rule, again, 2014, a rule that was changed is that if you are on dialysis, your, your time is already being accrued. So um, if you started dialysis 2016, you come to us now, then you've already got six years of waiting time. Uh, and, and this sort of uh, was put in place to try to even everything up. Um, your responsibility, absolutely, to follow up with the transplant coordinator uh, regarding any changes to medical condition, insurance, home address, dialysis, anything of that nature changes, then you do need to call us and let us know. Uh, next slide. Another change in allocation was uh, the beginning of last year, March of 2021. Uh, if you were listed in New York, your catchment area was Long Island, the Bronx, uh, Staten Island, Brooklyn, and you could head just sort of south of Albany, and that was it. Um, so we were reliant on uh, local donors. Uh, what happened um, in March of last year was they expanded that uh, criteria. And so now uh, we're looking at being literally going up to um, the top of Vermont, so uh, almost Boston area, um, all the way down to south of Washington. And this has really increased the number of trans deceased donor transplants that we've been doing um, here at Cornell. It, it, it's, it's really had quite a, an impact um, and, and our wait list, you know, our number of patients has actually gone down on the wait list, which is a good thing. Um, <clears throat> 
what happens if um, it's identified there is a donor now within this wider 250 mile uh, radius, uh, the coordinator will contact you if they feel that there is a relatively close chance to you maybe getting a kidney. We want to make sure that, again, you're healthy, you're not on any antibiotics, that um, you still have the same insurance, when did you last dialyze, all those types of things. And then we'll just have you on what we call on hold. Um, once things start to sort themselves out and we can see exactly where you're going to end up on the list. Hopefully you'll be the, one of the first two people and we'll be calling you again and at, telling you where to come. Uh, we give you all the instructions that you'll possibly need, what to bring, where to go, what time can you eat or drink, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and hopefully again, that call is yes, we're expecting to take you for a transplant at uh, you know, 7 a.m. in the morning. Next slide. So the surgery itself is very pretty uh, pictures over on the right hand side. So you can see exactly what it is we do. Uh, the two kidneys higher up, they're your native kidneys, your own kidneys and the one lower down as on the left here, um, that's the kidney that we actually put in, that's the donor kidney. Uh, the surgery takes about two to four hours. Um, they can be uh, usually keep you in the recovery room between six to 12. Uh, we want to watch your urine output, we want to watch your blood pressure, heart rate, um, and it's sort of like a little mini ICU until you're stable and then you're able to go back to the transplant floor. It's rare that a transplanted patient does require ICU, but I'm not going to say it's out of the realm of all possibility, uh, but it's, it's unusual for you to go to the ICU. Uh, your length of stay is on average four to six days, um, and your education is gonna start immediately. Uh, one of the key things about transplant is that you play as big a part in that transplant and the success of the transplant as anybody else. Uh, you may require a dialysis that for very few, you know, the first few days is sometimes something we call a sleep kidney. And indeed, about 40% of the deceased donor transplants we do, do take a few days to sort of wake up. Uh, you know, a kidney is removed from the donor and it's put into an ice box. It's that simple. And it's sitting in ice, can be, you know, 10, uh, 15, 20 hours. And so it's just a little reluctant to wake up initially. Uh, Post-operative follow-up, uh, you've done both in person and video visits. There's, you know, there's not much to be thankful about COVID, but this is one thing uh, that uh, we've decreased the number of visits actually coming to the center. Um, the further away from transplant you get, the less frequent your visits become. Indeed, at the third month, what we do is we share your care with your referring nephrologist. So we see you sort of stabilized in that first three months, get you on the right amount of medication. And then at that point, uh, we have you, uh, and again, we share your care. Uh, I will back up just for a second to the education starts immediately um, and we'll stress again that you do pay a huge amount um, on, on how successful your transplant is going to be. Um, we cannot stress enough the uh, compliance factor in this. Uh, missing medication, even just one every five, six days does pay a price. So uh, I, I off my soapbox, but, uh, but on you. So I see there are three questions. Um, Elisa, do you wanna uh, read those out? Okay. Um, we don't actually have any in here at the moment. We, we answered those already. Oh, okay. We are good. Preempting uh, the questions. And I, I do just wanna say, I know that a few people have their hands up. Um, we do just ask if you can please submit your questions in the Q&A section. Um, I messaged anyone who had their hand up. So if you'd like to either message me back or submit it through there, um, that would be the, the best way for us to get to all your questions. We can just allow for a minute to have that, that person with the raised hand type out their question, if that's something they're able to do.
and you know we can answer questions also at the end of course so if you are waiting till the end of the presentation but feel free to type in any questions that you have throughout the presentation and Elisa will field them I don't know we must be doing a really good job Eliza <laughs> No questions. I, I do think sometimes that, uh, oh. you know, webinars are great, but we do miss that sort of social interaction. Um, anyway, we actually just received two questions. Um, so the first question that someone is asking is, um, how long does a deceased donor kidney last? That's a very good question. Um, you know, again, this is something that can vary. Um, it, a deceased donor kidney tends to last around 10 years or so. Um, but if you get a 16 year old head trauma victim type donor um, and that kidney is relatively well matched to you, and you don't have a disease that's gonna come back into your new transplanted kidney, then that 10 years could become 20 or 30 years. So there's just so many factors, but I would say on average about 10 years. Thank you. And then the other question here, um, they're saying that their first stress test was done with dye. How often will this happen? Um, or seems like I'm trying to avoid the question. Uh, very much depends on you. If this was sort of as a baseline and you're otherwise healthy, don't have diabetes and no other cardiac disease, um, that could go two or three years. Um, if you have diabetes and you have had cardiac disease, then we would need to repeat that at a year. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. We are all caught up for right now with the questions. Great. Good. Okay. Well, um, again, keep and keep asking, and we'll we'll get to them. Um, really, just to echo what Judith had mentioned about the transplant medications, um, you do meet with a transplant pharmacist. So we are not transplant pharmacists. So I just want to preface that. But transplant medications, we determine the patient's risk for rejection. It's called the immunologic risks. High antibody levels mean that the patient is sensitized to foreign human antigens. And all of that testing is done before the transplant. Um, people can be sensitized and that can be by previous exposure to human antigens through blood transfusion, previous transplant, pregnancy. Chances are, if you are sensitized, you will know it because this will be a discussion that you have with your coordinator, with your nephrologist and um, with other members of the team. But that is just something that we do assess and we make sure that we're aware of when figuring out what medication regimen to put you on. Um, and again, this will all be covered more in depth when you meet with your transplant pharmacist. But just to go over the basics, um, you know, the purpose of an immunosuppression regime is to block the immune system using a combination of medications. Our bodies recognize the transplant as a foreign object. And so we are trying to make our body accept that you have a transplant and not have any form of rejection. Um, there's something called induction therapy and that provides a higher level of immunosuppression at the time of transplant and immediately post-operative. Those are typically IV medications. Um, often you could hear the meds thymoglobulin or Simulect and so those are done before and during the post-op period um, to prep the body, to let it be known that you are getting the transplant and to make that immune system kind of accept that foreign object. But you will be on maintenance therapy for the rest of your life. That is just really important to know. As Judith had mentioned, making sure the compliance with medications is huge because your body is constantly thinking that your transplant isn't a part of you. So those medications, are for life. And there's usually a minimum of two oral medications. Um, typically we have Prograf, Celsept, and you could be put on a steroid. Um, it just really depends on your sensitivity level and what your team has decided is best for you. There are some side effects with um, immunosuppression medications such as high blood pressure, diabetes, GI distress, hand tremors, and then you are at a higher risk of infection. So again, this is something that the 
transplant pharmacist will speak with you about, even our transplant dietitian will talk to you about things that you need to avoid when you are on immunosuppressive therapy. So something that I didn't realize, um, you know, you're not eating all those raw foods such as sushi or raw egg, you know, you have to be cognizant of the fact that you are more at risk for an infection. And of course, continued cancer screenings are very important because you do have a higher risk of malignancy. So that's just your typical screenings, colonoscopy for people age 45 and up, PSA for men, pap smears for women, and dermatology visits because you are more at risk for any sort of skin cancer. So these are just things to be mindful of, but as Judith had mentioned, maintaining, maintaining your immunosuppressive medications is so, so major and so important because these drugs will keep your transplant healthy and compliance with these medications are essential for the longevity of your kidney. Um, and I see we do have a couple questions, but we'll get to that in a minute. I'm just gonna go over just some of the highlights of our program. Now, um, sorry for a second, my computer is being slow. Okay, so the growth of our kidney program. You know, we are very proud of the Wild Cornell New York Presbyterian Kidney Transplant Program. We have been very busy in these last few years, as you can see. We are the highest volume kidney transplant center in New York. We are number one for living kidney donation. We are number four for living kidney donation in all of the United States. We're a Medicare approved center. And we're amongst the top kidney pair donation programs. You know, we work with the National Kidney Registry. We are one of the founding centers actually for kidney pair donation and exchange. Um, and actually this past 2021, we performed our 6,000th transplant. So just to tell you, you are in good hands here at our program. You know, our, our mission is to maximize transplant opportunities and transplantation in order to safely transplant each of our patients. So. As Judas had mentioned, transplant, we, we want to do transplants on people that it's going to extend their life and benefit them, increasing access, improving outcomes. So just a little highlight of our program successes. We are all about increasing transplant opportunities. As mentioned, our living donor kidney exchange program, we are transplanting patients who are ABO incompatible with um, swaps that are run nationally and we have positive cross-match transplants. We have ABO incompatible transplants as mentioned. Um, we are transplanting patients with HIV, Hep B, Hep C. We've experienced in managing the transplant needs of immunosuppression and those with active infections. Um, and then we are transplanting our pediatric patients as young as two using a steroid-free immunosuppression regimen. Now, again, this is kind of just a brief overview. We wanted to do a highlight today, but to tie everything up, we want to make sure we're re leaving you with resources. You are your biggest advocate. And so making sure that you are doing your homework, your research, staying in contact with our team. I can't recommend these websites enough. The transplantliving.org and the National Kidney Foundation, they are an incredible resource for you. They have information on deceased donor transplant, living donation, how to find a living donor, something called the Big Ask Big Give, which many of you may have attended. We try to partner with them every year to host the Big Ask Big Give. If you're interested in transplant outcomes and center information, the srtr.org is your best information source. And then pancreas transplant is something we didn't even touch on today, but we will do a presentation on that later down the road but there's some information at that website for pancreas transplant. And then lastly, we wanna help patients learn how to find living kidney donors. And this is a new website, it's called findakidney.org. And it has incredible resources for patients who are on the deceased donor waiting list who don't have living donors readily available to them. It helps you come up with strategies and we'll cover that a little bit more. Um, the next thing I would love to talk about for our patients is the opportunity to get matched with a transplant mentor. We are so fortunate to have so many resources for our patients, and this is a newer one that has become available. This is an opportunity for you to be matched with someone who has been through the process, someone who may be around your age, maybe is the same gender as you, maybe has similar life experiences. So someone that you can lean on and 
just have as a resource beyond your transplant center, your coordinator, your support system. And if you're interested in having a transplant mentor, we can set that up for you. And um, we just think it's a great resource because, because we know that this process can be lonely and frustrating and stressful. So having just someone who can listen to you and offer their advice. Now they don't offer medical advice, but just emotional support would be you know, very helpful. Um, and then something new again at our program that I'm really excited about is the microsite program. As mentioned, we work with the National Kidney Registry facilitating living donor transplants through the Parrot Exchange Program or the National Swaps, but we also work with them to offer patients microsites. And you may ask, what is a microsite? It is a free personalized website that you can create as a patient of ours to help you find a living donor. You can spread the word that you need a transplant and you just never know who may be touched by your story. Many people you know, feel uncomfortable sharing their story verbally. So this is an opportunity to break that barrier and get your story out there in ways that you may be feeling more comfortable doing. Um, you also get business cards when you create a site. And the greatest thing is you can share the site with your friends and family on social media via the email or a local newsletter. And you can have your donor champion, that person who may not be able to donate to you, but wants to support you and help you share your website. So you can use this QR code to register. Right now, you would just take out your phone and open up the camera, or you can just reach out to Judith or I, and we will help you create that microsite. And we'll go over this many times through our conversations with Cornell um, Kidney webinar. So just don't fear if you have more interest in this. Um, lastly, I wanna kind of just kind of highlight our website. We have a lot of information on our website and I would never want anyone to miss out on some of this rich information. We have an adult kidney transplant section. We have a pediatric kidney transplant section. We have a living kidney donor section. We have a comprehensive education center and our website is a resource free to you that you um, can use and share with people. If you just wanna educate yourself on your disease, your transplant process, how to find a living donor, what the process of living donation entails. So please check it out. And lastly, just connect with us. We have a great transplant community, our Facebook, our Instagram, our Twitter. I love seeing our patients interact with each other, supporting each other. We share stories that bring so much hope. We share events, we share education, we share resources. So please follow us, comment, message me. I'm the one who answers the messages. So if you would connect with us, it would be wonderful. Easily, you can just open up your cell phone and take a, and you know use the photo app and scan this QR code or just find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or Twitter. It's really a positive space. And I feel that if someone doesn't have a huge circle and a community themselves, this is a great place to feel welcome and supported by our team. And we welcome you. So thank you so much. We're gonna have our questions and comments section. I saw that we have three questions come through. So let's get to it. Thank you both so much for all of that. And I am more than happy to start working through some of these questions. Um, so someone here is saying that they currently work out on a treadmill two to three times a week and would prefer to use this method instead of the dye. Um, can this be a concern? This is in regards to that stress the stress test. test. Right. Yeah. Judith? <laughs> if you are working out, I mean, we've basically got to get your heart rate to a certain level. And, you know, I'm never going to tell anyone you can't do it, but just be aware that if you do not reach your target um, heart rate, then the, the, the study is null and void. So uh, if you can persuade your cardiologist to let you try to do that, um, it, it, we had to terminate so many of those tests and move over to the ones with the injection. That's why we sort of use the injection more now. Uh, but if you think that you can get your heart rate up, then you go for it. Good for you. And I approve of the treadmill, by the way. Excellent. Good news. So, and then, yeah. sorry, another question that we have here. 
um, is someone asking, why can't a donor that has diabetes give a kidney? You saw on those very first slides that diabetes, basically diabetes hypertension accounts for two thirds of the people with kidney disease. So if you are already got that mm -hmm. kind of risk factor, then you're not going to be allowed to give a kidney uh, because you're putting yourself at way too much risk. Judith, I agree with you. And I just brought that slide back up. Just something to tail end on that is that at the center, our living donor team's job is to make sure that that donor goes through the most thorough evaluation to make sure they're the absolute healthiest they possibly can be to make sure there's no risk to them in the future. So the process that the donor goes through to make sure that they don't have diabetes or high blood pressure is just to protect them in the long run. We know we can live healthy, long lives with one kidney, but if there's any risk that they may develop kidney disease in the future, you know, having diabetes is a huge risk. That is why it's because we don't want that donor to ever develop kidney disease. And so that's why there's such a thorough evaluation. And we have another question here that says, up to what age can you have a transplant? Uh -huh. this, that's, uh, again, I, I'm getting some fun questions here. We do not have an absolute cutoff. The oldest transplant that we ever did was a lady that was 87 years of age. Um, could every 87 year old undergo transplant? No, they couldn't. Uh, you know, even if they don't, uh, uh, we want to prolong your life, not shorten it. So I would say everything is looked at on a case by case basis, but there is no automatic cutoff at the center. Now, if you're coming and you're 85 and you have blood group O, blood group B, and you're looking at at least a sort of six-year wait. So that now puts you, we're looking more at 92 by the time you'd be getting a transplant. That, uh, that's really pushing it. So I think, you know, if you are thinking of being evaluated and you are in your 80s, then the best way to do this is by getting a living donor. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you both so much. Um, we have made it through all of the questions. I will give everyone a minute to submit any additional questions that they have. Um, and of course, if you think of things after the webinar, which I know I am always guilty of, um, I never have a question in the moment and then later I do, uh, you are welcome to email me directly and I can put you in contact with both Judith and Eliza. Um, but I do thank all of you for joining us today. And Judith and Eliza, thank you for such a wonderful and detailed explanation. Um, I think it was extremely informative and helpful. And I hope that um, we were able to answer any and all questions that everyone has. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, for thank you. Everyone who, who oh. joined, um, just to shout out the beautiful thing with this webinar is if you've already signed up, you are already registered for next month. Next month, we're going to do a real in-depth dive into living donation. We understand this is such a bountiful topic. And so we knew we couldn't do that in this one. We wanna give it all the attention it deserves. We're gonna talk about what makes a good donor, which we did cover today, but just the process Luckily, we have Judith who has managed the living donor team. She understands the ins and outs, the back end. So we're going to go through that. And then we'll talk about strategies on ways you can try and find a living donor that maybe you haven't considered. So please stay tuned for next time. And if you have questions that you would really like us to focus in on, mm -hmm. submit them. We would absolutely love that if we can know ahead of time, if there's specific questions. Um, and I'm going to put on the next slide, which has our contact information. And please just call us with any questions you have. I'd also like to add that in the next couple of days, we will be sending out an email to anyone who registered for today's session. And it will include a link to the recording, um, as well as links to some of the resources that were discussed today and the contact information.
Are there any other questions? Don't make them so hard next week. You, you gave me some real doozies. Uh, and the, uh, the person that asked about parking, the Parkinson's donor, um, I will get the information from Elisa and I can either call you or email you, whichever you prefer. Um, we can discuss. We'll absolutely get that uh, taken care of, Judith. I'll make sure that the two of Thank you are Thank you. Oh, we have one more question. Um, so someone is asking what percentage of transplants are living donors? Historically at Cornell, um, we have been doing over 65% of our transplants have been living donors. The last couple of years, uh, uh, there has been sort of a drop in that trend and it has been more, I would say 45 uh, to 50%. Uh, but we are looking, you know, there's sort of been a rebound this year. So it can be because people are fearful of employment or, or whatever. We saw a similar drop in living donation back in 2008 when there was a lot of uh, tumultuous sort of uh, things going on. So uh, hopefully we do see that increase because, again, you know, cannot stress enough. If you can get a living donor, it is absolutely the way to go. Your kidney is going to last you twice as long. They just work better. Uh, because we're starting with a very healthy kidney. So, uh, you know, otherwise the donor wouldn't be able to donate. So a long answer to a short question, but uh, uh, so yeah, hoping to rebound this year so that it's at least over 50%. Yeah, and Judith, just to bring up a stat I found, in 2020, we had 52% of our 198 transplants, 102 of them were living donors. And so, like you said, we took a day. We took a, a hit um, uh, and again. 2008, uh, 2020. I think anytime people are in fear of jobs, their situation, health insurance, whatever it might be, and COVID. Uh, it's, yes, it's yeah. it's absolutely there. There's more fear added, and, and people back off. But we we will see an increase again. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, we really. You know, look forward to you joining us at the next session. Um, and that session will be on Tuesday, August 30th. Um, since you've signed up for this session, as we said, it's a recurring session. So you will receive the reminder emails and we will be sending out a follow-up email to all of you um, with the recording as well as contact information and the links that were discussed today. Thank Bye, you all everyone. so much. And Thanks, we hope everyone. to see you next month. Thank Hopefully. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.